on part two of our successful service business series with Fred Ross, he talks about managing expenses and handling price increases on supplies. If you missed part one, go back and listen to Fred on preparing to hire your very first service employee. The Pool Pro Podcast begins now. But today we're really going to talk about the business side. And I'm excited because this gentleman we have on today, he has done it all. He has started a business, he's grown a business, and he's sold a business. And I want him to talk about his story. And then he's going to give you some tips on how you can grow and even take the first step to growing if that's what you're interested in doing. So please welcome today, Fred Ross. Welcome, Fred. Thanks, hey, thanks, Fred, guys. how are you today? I'm doing great. Fantastic. I'm, that's what happened to us. So we kept growing, kept growing. We, we got more into the commercials and less into the residentials. And our chemical use skyrocketed. And pretty soon I thought, wow, I'm hearing, I'm hearing through the grapevine and my competitors are getting their chlorine for 60 and 70 cents a gallon. And I'm paying two and three, two bucks a gallon and more. How are they doing that? Uh, well, there is a point there then at which that your volume gets to the point where you can go direct on some of your major expenses, right? And wow, all I got to do is set up my own facility and my own tanks and all this stuff. I can start buying by the tanker load, 5,000 gallons at a time. And, and no, I couldn't get down to that price that they were getting, but I could get pretty close. I closed the gap a lot. And so yes. all of a sudden... All of a sudden, all the chlorine that we're selling became our number one profit item. So my margins went from 10 or 15, 20%, because I could, couldn't put that much of a markup on there, to 60%. One of the first things I saw when in, in, the, in the residential side of the business was I kind of got killed on as prices went up over the years. If I bundled it all into a flat rate to the customer and said, your yeah. monthly service. That's what I was thinking. Month, you were bundling it all in as. The flat rate, and that's why I was confused. Yeah. yeah. Well, we did. Everybody yeah. used to do it that way. All everything's bundled in, the chemicals, the filter cleans, all that stuff was all pre-included in the price, right? Yep. And then was well, the price of grids would go up, chlorine, all these things like, like no, I'm getting killed. Because I can't readjust my prices to the customer, but maybe once a year, once every six months, maybe, and then then they're gonna balk even if I just try to get two or three percent out of them. They're gonna, you know, you try to do more than that, they're gonna shop you and quit you. I don't care how good you're doing. You just can't have these big price increases. So and they don't want to hear that your costs go up. They don't care. They don't care. No, they, they don't. don't. No, they don't care. Nobody does. No nobody matter does. what industry you're in. Yeah. Yeah, nobody does. So that kind of leads you to, well, what can I do then to control what control that can I have over my cost drivers, things that are driving up my cost of doing business. And you really don't have any. There are some buying clubs. There's some things IPSA does. There's some things other people do, but you really don't have any until you get to a certain amount of volume. And even at the smaller volumes, you can go into SCP and PWP and PEP and start cutting deals and get better prices than the guy with one truck and one pole's paying. I hate to tell him that, but it, it's true and it happens, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're putting in UV systems, saline systems, control systems, everything. You do enough of it and you can start getting some deals. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> like, 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 you know, heaters, we, we got to the point where we were doing, I don't know, 15, 20 heaters a month. And you, you think can I get got a better deal on heaters. Yeah. Percent less uh, cost yeah. <laughs> than anybody else that sold two heaters a year. Of course I did. Okay. So there are volume discounts in there and you don't have to be an SCP to get them. Uh, even when we just were smaller and, and we started doing, you know, uh, I started going through a lot of tabs or a lot of chlorine or, you know, a lot of nets, anything. I mean, I would just go into the local SCP branch office and I'd say, hey, why don't you pull up the record there on how much money I spent with you last year? And let's, let's sit down and talk about that. And I, I want some special prices and they'll do that. Okay, so yep. that's one thing that you guys can do to help control our costs. That makes sense. So that, it seems to me like that that brings up a good point. Um, when you start to grow in volume, it's really important to find out who your outside salespeople are, both from the manufacturers and the distributors, 
and and get build relationships with those people and and make them value you as a client when they see you as a person and not just a number then uh they, yes. they value you more and they're, they're more willing to work with you well that's exactly right and that's the one thing i think i picked up from the builders is that they do that better than the service guys do for sure uh they will commit to the factory reps they'll say all right we're going to be a pentair shop or we're going to be a hayward shop mm -hmm. or we're, you know, jandy shop whatever and mm -hmm. everything we sell we're going to push your stuff as hard as we can we're going to rip out those hayward pumps and put in pentair pumps or vice versa right and at one point in time i'm now on the agnostic i don't care i'm just going to give the customer whatever i think is the best for them but at some point in time you're right dave we started to say hmm we need to make some strategic alliances here and yep. we need to say yeah it's not that i'll never sell another hayward piece of equipment but or another Pentair piece of equipment, but we're going to make somebody in the number one position. And you tell them that and you tell them, I'm going to commit to you. I'm going to try to get as much business for you as I can. And you're going to be my number one partner. And in yeah. turn for that, I want something back from you. What are you going to do to help me? Whether it's MDF for marketing, marketing money, help with a show, help with an event, uh, rebates, whatever. I didn't care, but I want them to do something that make me stand out, right? Yeah, it's a win-win. They will. Win -win. Yeah. It's a win-win, and they're happy to do it. Yeah. They're happy to do it, because they don't get very many companies that are willing to make that commitment. Yeah. They just don't want to commit, right? They're afraid. So, um, so as you're going along here, you're building your steps, you're hiring your guys, and you get to that first, next big hurdle which is well now what do i maybe, maybe you want to stop maybe that's it you got four or five yeah. guys i know several guys they got four or five guys they they do the repairs now they're pretty much the full-time repair guy you're pretty much full-time and you got what do you got uh three four hundred pools mm -hmm. right repairs all the time right yes even if this is little stuff so with filter cleans in there your filter between your preventative maintenance and that you're, you're that's pretty much full-time job and then maybe they have someone in the family, the kids, wife, somebody, or maybe they just outsource that for the billing and the office work and they're, and they're good, right? And they're like, wow, yeah. a nice business. And maybe they're happy at that. Because then the next big one is you got to replace yourself now as the repair guy. And you're going to yeah. become a supervisor over the pool service techs and the repair guy. But now you got to replace yourself and that's an expensive hire and that's a hard guy to find yeah good senior repair guys that know what they're doing uh, they're not cheap <laughs> yes. you know and you think wow i gotta pay this guy 60 70 80 grand a year Ooh, that, that's a how problem. am i gonna do that right exactly. how am i gonna do that right so <laughs> again you're gonna have this hit again now, if you're taking out all the money that the business is making, it's going to hurt big. And so a lot of guys don't go past that. They, ah, I'm not going to do that. It's not worth it. But if you're not kind of living below your means, and now you've got the buffer in there built in and your financial plan, assuming you're even doing one, that's a whole other thing. So even you're doing, we'll talk about that in a minute. So then you're ready for it. And you're ready for that repair guy. And you know what impact it's going to have on your profitability and how much you take home. And you're like, great, not a problem. Oh, wow, I can probably get pool tech number six, seven, eight. At what point do you max out that one repair guy? Oh, this is great. But you know, Johnny's been bugging me. He's been cleaning pools for me for me for three years now. And he's tired of it and he wants to move up. Oh, yeah, which makes Jack sense. That here, makes sense to but, me. Yeah. Yeah. But Jack, who's the master repairman, yeah, he doesn't like doing filter cleans and that stuff. That's below him. <laughs> yeah. And he needs an apprentice. Oh, this is good. So now I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to cut him down. Say, oh, I'm going to cut your workload down in half. And you're going to apprentice over here with the master guy half, and, half the week. And everybody's happy. He's happy. Brindis is happy, master guy's happy. And the other pool guys go, hmm, I'm starting to see a career path here. 
for some crazy reason, pool technicians always think they want to be a repairman. They think the repairman got it made. They just cruise in and <laughs> they got all these cool tools and they, oh, I'm just going to spend all day putting this UV system in. Look at me, man. I'm Mr. Big Brain. And, and, and I'm, and I'm going to do, I'm going to spend two days doing this pump room thing. And I only have to do three or four calls a day. And they look at that and they think, man, that repair guy's got it made. And I pr promoted a lot of guys and groomed them from pool men to repairmen. And after they're repairmen for two or three weeks, they go, oh, this is too hard. I want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> not as easy as they think, right? It's not as easy as they think. That's right. So, so can, can, we, can we summarize what you were said so far then? Because yeah. um, I think, you know, obviously it makes sense what you're saying, you know, for the for hiring the first supervisor and kind of, and then you just keep expanding from there. That's kind of the next step. Yes. Is the third step preparing it to sell that if you choose to sell? Is that the third well, step? Depends on how big, that depends on how big you want to make it. Yeah. Because so at some point, the goal are. is to either sell or to, to pass it along to family or, or something, right? Whatever your goal is, right? Yeah. So Dave, go ahead. I'm sorry. Along. Yeah. If you pass it along, maybe at some point. The problem with that is you don't get the money for retirement if you pass it along to the family unless they buy it, you know. But Dave, what, what was your question? Well, even going back way before that, I, I like yeah, no, I agree. That Fred said, um, starting out with not buying the most expensive decked out work truck. Yes. When you start, he, he bought the simplest truck. No carpeting on the floor is the best way to go with a pool truck because you're going to run the carpet <laughs> anyway. Um, and and at every point you you hit that again. Um, don't spend everything you make. Don't live check to check. You've got to find a way to, to put some money aside and have some yes. capital. That that's that's the only way you're ever going to grow. If you're if you're yes. constantly behind the eight ball financially, you're just going to reach a point where it just overwhelms you. Like you said, Fred, you're going to have to kind of take a hit at the beginning to get the first person, and you're going to have to decide how you're going to do that. Whether it be, you know. If your wife isn't working, maybe she has to get a job just just temporarily, just to get the, through the through this first stage. And then, like you said, once you reap the benefits of it, then you can change it up. But there's going to have to be some sort of, you know, the only thing you can do, as everybody knows, is 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 increase your revenue or reduce your expenses. I mean, and you're trying to increase your revenue, and and in the meantime, you're going to have to reduce your expenses to be able to get this first person hired. And that's the step that is the scariest. And this isn't just in the pool industry, as we know. How many Americans? Um, live paycheck to paycheck in every industry you know it's a lot it's a it's a you know money management is not something you're taught well when you're younger oh. I don't understand why they don't teach that in the at the school level on how to manage money why are they not teaching that in middle school and high school and things like that how to manage your money because nobody if you don't have parents that know what they're doing and are able to teach you that from a, a young age you don't know how to do it no you don't you know you don't. You really That's don't. That's the scary part of this of this whole scenario. A new voice in the industry, a resource for all, education for you. This is Pool Pro Podcast. Build relationships and share important news as we get ready for our next backyard adventure. Pool Pro Podcast. Backyard adventures are better together. Please take a moment to share, like, and review our content with all of those that would be interested.